afternoon, my conscious co-creators. Welcome to another edition of the Conscious Consultant Hour Awakening Humanity. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you're tuning in from, whether you're tuning in here live on talkradio.nyc or you're tuning in on KMET out in uh, Palm Springs, California. Thank you all for tuning in today. Uh, welcome to another great show. I have a, a really fascinating guest in store for you today. But first, of course, we have our little section from my book, Everyday Awakening, You Are More Powerful Than You Know. And uh, today, this week's section is entitled, Investing in Kindness Yields Many Returns of Joy. We all think about the return we get on what we spend. We invest our time into a project. What's the payoff? If we invest our money, what's the rate of return? Yet how do we measure the return on our kindness? How do we truly, do we truly, do we know truly how our kindness affects other people? Can we see all the ripples that it generates? Do we give our kindness away to receive something? Or is it just because it is the proper thing to do? What is truly amazing is to see how those who give their kindness away without any thought of a return, of getting a return on it, often get so much back in return. Perhaps a small act of kindness is captured on camera by someone watching the, and the video goes viral. Perhaps we once did an act of kindness for a friend in need, and when we, when we are in need, that friend shows up and is there for us when we least expect it. Or perhaps our acts of kindness create a kind community around us. It is hard to know how the seeds we plant will sprout. These seeds of kindness we plant not for our personal gain, but just for the sake of helping others to shine some light in a dark place for the sake of our sense of doing the right thing. Kindness sometimes feels so good in the moment because we wish someone had been kind to us when we were in a similar situation in the past. We may relish in creating a moment of joy in someone's life. This creates a moment of joy for us too. That's the real return on investment when it comes to kindness. We invest in kindness to create more joy, and then it ripples outward through them, creating more joy for others, even for people we don't know. So is it worth investing in kindness even if we don't see a return? Absolutely. What acts of kindness could you create today? So I, I, I wrote this section of my book um, after seeing this um, or, or seeing this story about a video where a gentleman uh, uh, bought a cup of coffee for a stranger at a fast food restaurant. And, and, and the guy didn't ask anything. I think he looked like he was homeless. He was obviously down on his luck. And, and the guy who bought him the coffee, he just bought him the coffee, left it and walked out. And I think somebody else videotaped it. And then they, they followed the guy and, and they asked him, what did that cup of coffee mean to him? And he said, you know, this morning I was considering killing myself. I felt like the world was so cruel, nobody cared, there was no one there for me. If that gentleman hadn't bought this cup of coffee, I may not still be here today. And it really struck me because, and that video went viral and the story went viral, it was all over the internet for a while. And the guy who bought that man the cup of coffee, he didn't, do it to create a viral video. He didn't do it for what he was getting out of it. He just did it to be kind. And he had no idea that anyone was watching. He had no idea that somebody would even make a video of it, 
let alone it going viral, let alone people seeing that video around the globe, he had no idea how that one little act of kindness rippled out into the world. And so oftentimes we, we sometimes think to ourselves, well, why should I be kind? Nobody's being kind to me. Why should I be kind? You know, people, you know, can be so mean and nasty. Because we're thinking about, well, what am I going to get in return? And here's the thing. If we're thinking about what kind of return we're getting for our kindness, it's not true kindness. It's an investment. It's a transaction. And when we're looking for a transaction, that's exactly the wrong way to be kind. That's not real kindness. Yet when we show kindness to others, not for what we're going to get out of it, not for any sense of return, but just because it's the right thing to do, just because it feels like the right thing to do in our heart. Just performing the act itself is all the return we need. It makes us feel good. And we have no idea how that little act of kindness will ripple through the world and what it could mean. And, and I've been on a bit of a kindness kick lately with all the sections from my book. A lot of them talk about kindness because for me personally, I see and have experienced the difference when people are being kind to me and to others and when they're not being kind. And I see the difference it makes in how people are able to show up because that those little acts of kindness, those little kind words, it means the world to everyone. And indeed, the smallest act of kindness can create a, a huge movement and is so important. In some ways, there are areas of the world that are less kind than they've been before. In other places, they're more kind. The one thing is for certain. We cannot have too much kindness in this world. And indeed, if we allow ourselves to receive the gift of being a giver of kindness, it lightens up our own heart. It makes our own day feel good. Helping an elderly person across the street, picking up a piece of garbage on the sidewalk and putting it in a garbage pail, you know, not cutting somebody off in traffic, giving someone a lift when they need it. These little things, we think nothing of them. They can be so, so important to the other person. So I say all this to say that investing in kindness is the best investment we can make with our energy. And an investment in kindness, regardless of whether the other person appreciates it or not, it yields us more dividends than we can possibly know. So it is never ever a waste to invest in kindness because what it does for us is just as great as what it does for the other person and what it does for the world the energy it puts out into the world is actually one of the best things that we can do so uh, that's my little section from my book everyday awakening it's entitled Investing in Kindness Yields Many Returns of Joy. Uh, the book is Everyday Awakening. You are more powerful than you can know. Uh, you can get it at www.everydayawakeningbook.com. And uh, that's just, you know, for the listing on Amazon. But if you're like me and you like to 
uh, frequent independent uh, bookstores, please go to the independent bookstore. If they don't have it in stock, just ask them to order it for you. We're in all the major booksellers, so uh, book distributors, so like any bookstore can get it. So I hope uh, you got something out of it and, and that you'll appreciate it. And so um, now it is my pleasure uh, to welcome to the show uh, Rob, uh, author and speaker Rob Holman. Rob is a global keynote speaker and three-time leadership author of, of three best-selling books, Lead the Way, All In, and Move the Needle. In 2022, he was named one of the world's top 30 leadership thought leaders, and his inside-out leadership philosophy has been featured in publications like Inc. Magazine, Forbes, and Fast Company. Welcome to the Conscious Consultant Hour, Rob. Sam, it's a complete honor. I'm so looking forward to having a conversation with you today. And I've already been greatly encouraged by the portion of the book on kindness that you shared. It's right up my alley. So I think we're going to have a wonderful dialogue. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you, Rob. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's kind of funny how the whatever the section of the book that happens to come up is always so apropos for the conversation that day. So we just have a couple of minutes before uh, we take a little break. Um, I would just like to know what got you interested in focusing on leadership in your life? Was there somebody in your life early on? Was there some incident that happened? Like what got you to really say, oh, like leadership is really where it's at? Yeah, really at the core, great question. At the core, it's personal leadership because I'm a firm believer in you can only give what you got. Uh, there's an ancient saying that says freely you have received to freely give. And so for me, uh, one of those pivotal moments, the time of awakening for me, I mean, true awakening was 21 years old, heading into my best year of my life, my senior year of university or college. Uh, one major problem though, Sam, I had a tumor in my abdomen that went without a clear diagnosis for six weeks. Ooh. I got CAT scans, MRIs, ultrasound. The doctors were not ruling out cancer because the mass was just so abnormal. It was growing, it was extremely painful, but they didn't know exactly what it was. So they didn't know exactly what to do with it until what I share with you completely rocked my world beyond, beyond human comprehension. Here's what happened. I saw an ultrasound specialist that I had not seen before. Mm -hmm. He begins to check me out like all the other doctors had before, but this time to his utter amazement and looking at, and, and you know, making sure that, you know, taking his hands, trying to feel out this mass and looking on the screen to his utter amazement, these words came out of his mouth. Rob, what you walked in with today, a clear mass, you have no longer. It was called, later would be called a modern day miracle. Now, wow. leading up to that point, Sam, in my life at 21 years old, purpose for me was winning the next basketball game, was hanging out with my friends and having fun. That was purposeful living. But you better believe now, coming out of this miraculous set of circumstances, I started to ask things I'd never asked before. Yeah. Who am I? Why am I really here? And what's the sphere of influence that I've been given that no one else on the planet's been given but me? And how can I faithfully serve them with every aspect of who I am? Wow. Wow. It changed a... everything for me. And that truly started the journey of leadership and personal leadership. And little did I know that now, over 25 years later, I'd be helping leaders all around the world discover or rediscover who they are. Wow, that's amazing. I'm just curious. I mean, did you do anything before you saw that ultrasound specialist to do it? It just, it just, or did it just disappeared on its own? Yeah, it just disappeared by itself. And and if wow. the story, if the story's not bizarre all within itself, what makes it more bizarre was I still had pain in my abdomen as he's telling me this story. The pain was there when I left his office. Huh. However, the pain started to subside the more people that I told what had happened, the huh. goodness of what occurred, the miracle that transpired. And I kid you not, I probably went back to the college campus and told about a third of the college campus what had happened. Sure and happened. little by little, the pain left my body and within 24 hours after I started sharing it with people, it left my body in its entirety and it's never been back. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. Wow. That, that's truly something. Something like that happens and that really rocks your world. So that's amazing. I have to share with you a story about um, 
a teacher I, I work with, but I want to take a quick break first. Um, and then when we come back, we'll talk about that a little bit more. And then let's get into sort of how you developed your take on leadership and how that sort of came about the journey to, to kind of find leadership within your own life. Okay, Rob? Great. Sounds great. Awesome. So everyone, please stay tuned. You're listening to the Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity. We do this every Thursday live here at talkradio.nyc, every Wednesday morning at KMET in, in uh, uh, Palm Springs, California. And we will be right back with Rob Holman in just a moment. Are you a business owner? Do you want to be a business owner? Do you work with business owners? Hi, I'm Stephen Fry, your small and medium-sized business or SMB guy. And I'm the host of the new show, Always Friday. While I love to have fun on my show, we take those Friday feelings of freedom and clarity to discuss popular topics on the minds of SMBs today. Please join me and my various special guests on Friday at 11 a.m. on talkradio.nyc. Are you a conscious co-creator? Are you on a quest to raise your vibration and your consciousness? I'm Sam Leibowitz, your Conscious Consultant, and on my show, The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, we will touch upon all these topics and more. Listen live at our new time on Thursdays at 12 noon Eastern Time. That's The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, Thursdays, 12 noon on talkradio.nyc. Are you on edge? Hey, we live in challenging, edgy times, so let's lean in. I'm Sandra Bargeman, the host of The Edge of Every Day, which airs each Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time on talkradio.nyc. Tune in live with me and my friends and colleagues as we share stories and perspectives about pushing boundaries and exploring our rough edges. That's The Edge of Every Day on Mondays at 7 p.m. Eastern Time on talkradio.nyc. You're listening to Talk Radio NYC. Uplift, educate, empower. Welcome back to the Conscious Consultant Our Awakening Humanity. So, Rob, your story really touches me. It, it reminds me of a story of, of one of my teachers from a number of years ago, this woman, Brandon Bays, who created this um, sort of emotional and physical healing technique called The Journey. And she had been one of Tony Robbins' uh, early uh, health coaches. And she had kind of a similar experience where she had... I mean, a little more extreme, but she had a tumor in her abdomen, like the size of a basketball. Wow. And she refused to have surgery. She she pleaded with the doctors to help her work on it, uh, to, to give her a month to work on it. And she went and um, she tried all different kinds of healings. Nothing was working. And she finally went to see this woman who was a body worker. And the woman said, you know, it feels like there's some grief, there's some sadness in here. And she kind of went into the tumor and this huge flood of emotion came out. And then over the course of the next month, the tumors shrank, 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 and shrank until it disappeared. And she created this whole body of work called the journey. And it's something that uh, I, I've, I've done in the past and I do as a, as a healer to help people. And, and it just, these kinds of miracles I mean, you know what they say, a miracle is not something that's impossible. It's just highly improbable. Um, they do happen in people's lives. And it's so fascinating to see how different people respond to them. So th this miracle happened to you. you. You tell everyone about it. What, what, was, what was it that got you to say, like, I'm going to be a leadership coach. I'm going to focus on leadership. Like, what was it about leadership specifically that, that, you know, made you decide like, that's what you want to dedicate your life to? You know, I'd always been a leader ever since I was a little kid, people would look to me, uh, I always had a 
different groups of friends. I wasn't in like just a click. I, I sports and I was into speaking. I was into different things. And so I had a diversity of friends. And oftentimes people, I didn't know um, much about leadership at that particular time, other than Sam, that people would look to me, they'd ask me for answers. They would look for guidance or encouragement. But coming out of this unusual, miraculous set of circumstances, um, I, I'm a self-starter. I'm a, I'm a serial entrepreneur. So I started my first business right out of college. I had two companies by age of 23. Uh, and you probably know where it goes off from there. I just continue, continue, continue. And along that journey of having a higher perspective on myself and other people and being a student of who people are, what makes them tick and come alive, what you know, the challenges they may face. Now I'm employing people with two companies by age of 23. I'm employing people. I'm in strategic alliance and partnership with others. I'm all these different things. So now my purpose has never been more clear. I was a student of people and something deep on the inside of me just would continue to rise up being like people were meant for much more than just going through the motions. Just cashing in a paycheck, just the next big sale. There's got to be more to life than going through the motions. And so it, my journey really started in, a, in many regards, age 21, when I went through what I shared with you a few, a few minutes ago. But then it continues as I started my entrepreneurial journey. Through that, I gained even a greater awareness of who I was, my personal mission, calling, call it whatever you want, and how I could use my superpower, so to speak, of being alive with my purpose and my mission to truly serve other people and help remove any obstacles that perhaps they'd have in their own life so they can live a life of fulfillment and be of greater good, not only to those within their sphere of influence, but ultimately the world. So as I continue down that journey, now there's a word that kind of steps into the conversation. It's called stewardship. I wanted to really begin to be a a good steward of who I was and who was entrusted in my care. So it just grew more fuel on the fire of purpose and more. And I was, um, I never wanted it to solely be about me. Now there were points along my journey where, you know, a lot kind of looking, do I get my name in the paper for this or that along my entrepreneurial journey? But ultimately deep down inside, I knew Sam that I wanted to elevate people. Mm. I knew that I want to come alongside of people, dare I say, get under them only to lift them up to be all that they were truly created to be. Now, you've been doing this a long time, 20 years, over 20 yeah. years, you've said. You know, leadership sounds like one of those things that's relatively timeless, but people today kind of feel like we're in a different kind of world than we were 20 years ago. Do you see that the challenges in, in working with people and helping people to become more mindful leaders are they different today than they were 20 years ago or are they still, it's still relatively the, the same core things? My answer would be yes to all the above. I, I think that there are, um, there's some general things, I think, regardless of generation, regardless of trials and tribulations that uh, human beings are human beings. And that's in the West. That's also in the East. Uh, at the same time, I think you'd agree with this. That there's some general principles that, uh, are applicable regardless of the time, regardless of the person, et cetera. But this world's moving pretty fast. Yeah. And I think the average person, and I'll even say this, I'll put my hand up in the air, Sam. I think we're just trying to keep up yeah. with how fast things are moving. Yeah. The challenge, even the temptation at times in, in trying to stay up is our mind and our heart can easily be divided. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I got to do this. I got to do more of that. The fear of missing out. Well, what happens if I don't start this now? Well, as opposed to looking at the person, experiencing the person that's with us right now, the idea that's taking shape right now. And in order to be present in a crazy busy world, it requires some things of us. Yeah. We've got to be aware of the default mechanisms of going down this fast paced life and leadership. But we've got to be willing at the same time to put times in our schedule to be reminded of certain things, the people and the things that matter most, and not feel bad about putting certain things in our schedule right. so that now we give into a certain discipline, a certain rhythm 
of, you know, spending time by ourselves, for instance, spending time in my case with my wife of 18 years and my three kids and having not just quality of time, but quantity of time, because I believe both are needed and both are true. And when I etch them in my schedule, that tells me and it tells them that they're important. But then in time, the discipline begins to give way into more of a lifestyle. To where I don't need to put it in my schedule anymore. Right, I'm finding right. reasons. Natural. I'm finding reasons to come home early from work. I'm finding reasons to spend time with my bride. I'm finding reasons to hang out with my kids on a one-to-one -one or group basis because I'm compelled to do so out of a very deep place because I'm mindful and aware of certain things. Yeah, it, it's and, and what you said about giving time to yourself and to those closest to you, your family, I've found that over the last two and a half years during the pandemic, people began to value those things much more because it's almost like it was forced upon us externally. But then it's like it gave people the opportunity to reevaluate their values in life. And so they realized that like, you know, working 12 hours a day is not does not serve me, does it? Right. No, it does not. I mean, because again, I get back to an anchoring point I brought up earlier that we can only give what we got. Right. And so many of us, because of the crazy, busy, fast paced lives in which we live or attempted to live, uh, many of us are running on fumes, if not burn out and may not fully realize it. So we're giving ourselves and we're giving those closest to us leftovers. Right. Right. And that's not fair to who we are as human beings. That's not certainly fair to those within our sphere of immediate influence. And so I want to be the best steward of who I am and who's been entrusted my care so I can make a greater difference, a greater impact in this world. Right, right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because we can't give from a cup that's only half full. That's right. Because then we're not really going to be able to give what the other person needs. And all it's going to do is drain us and make us feel like we don't have enough. But if we, but if our cup is overflowing and we give from our overflow, then we're truly able to give what the other person needs. That's right, Sam. And I think too, I just want to address this because when you live a busy life, a lot of activity, busy life and a lot of activity doesn't always equate to the best activity and the most effective activity. And so for me, I'm just committed to live a life and, and my leadership as well with not going after the masses. I want to go after the one. And I've just, I've, I've learned and I've appreciated that when I'm committed to going after the one, being present with the one who's before me, I will reach the masses in and through the one. But I've got to say no to the masses, no to trying to cast a net far and wide to try to affect and reach everyone positively all at the same time. And when I say no to that, I actually get to say yes a bit more to the one in front of me. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. I love that. I love that, Rob. Um, uh, we got to take another quick break. I, when we come back, I do want to talk to you about like the challenges that we face today, because there's some pretty big challenges out there. And how do you like maintain your positivity and your, your energy when we're faced with so many of these challenges all at once? Because there's a lot and it's a lot happening all at once. Okay, so I want to take us there afterwards. I do see loyal listener Patty on the uh, YouTube live stream checking in with us today and sharing the video. Thank you so much, Patty. Always appreciate my loyal listeners who tune in every week. Um, thank you, Patty, for being here. All right. So everyone, please stay tuned. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, uh, we'll continue on with Rob Holman, author of Lead the Way. Are you passionate about the conversation around racism? Hi, I'm Reverend Dr. TLC, host of the Dismantle Racism Show, which airs every Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern on talkradio.nyc. Join me and my amazing guests as we discuss ways to uncover, dismantle, and eradicate racism. That's Thursdays at 11 o'clock a.m. on talkradio.nyc. Are you a small business trying to navigate the COVID-19 related employment laws? Hello, I'm Eric Sauver, employment law business law attorney and host of the new radio show, Employment Law Today. On my show, we'll have guests to discuss the common employment law challenges 
business owners are facing during these trying times. Tune in on Tuesday evenings from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern Time on talkradio.nyc. Hey everybody, it's Tommy D, the nonprofit sector connector coming at you from my attic. Each week here on talkradio.nyc, I host a program, Philanthropy in Focus. Nonprofits impact us each and every day, and it's my focus to help them amplify their message and tell their story. Listen each week at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time until 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on talkradio.nyc. You're listening to Talk Radio NYC at www.talkradio.nyc. Now broadcasting 24 hours a day. Welcome back. We're talking this hour with Rob Holman. So, Rob, these days we're really dealing with a lot of challenges. I mean, things are politically more divided than ever before. Families are divided over um, some of these social issues. There's, there's challenges with the environment and the ecology world. There's war and the threat of, of the war escalating. How do we as leaders? face all that and still maintain our positivity and still maintain our energy and 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 sort of, I don't want to say being optimistic, but kind of like being realistic, but still moving in a, in a forward direction. Yeah, there was an article, Sam, that came out in a Harvard column, I want to say just a couple months ago. And the columnist uh, cites a, a Deloitte survey of executives. And in the survey, it said that about 70% of exec- C-suite executives, regardless of size of the organization, are thinking about leaving their existing workplace because of their well-being. And wow. then it continues to cite, and outside of the C-suite, about 57% of our employees are thinking about doing the same thing. Hmm. So these statistics are now coming out that people are tired in large part because they don't feel well. Yeah. Their well-being's at stake to, enough to say, I'm willing to leave this good job, good money, good responsibility to jump ship, hoping that a different culture is going to better take care of me, nurture who I am as a human being and my professional development as well. So one of the things that I love to highlight in light of making sure that we stay on point with our well-being and how we can foster well-being within the workplace as well as leaders is if we look for the good, we'll find it. It's whether or not we're looking for it. Hmm. It's so easy in life and leadership and workplace culture to just deal with problems. I mean, here's a problem, here's a problem. And then meetings and one-to-one times, it's, it, we become obsessed about the problem and then we'll bring solutions eventually into solving the problem. But I think we can become really inundated and focused on the problem more than the good in the midst of it. Mm. And I'm here to say, if leaders spend a bit more time beginning with themselves, their own personal lives, regardless of trials, tribulations, challenges, obstacles, barriers, call it whatever you want. When we are committed to look for the good, and I'm talking specifically, and engage our senses in that place of goodness, as small as it may seem, it can't help but work itself out into the world and the culture around us. And, and so, and there's studies that also show, Sam, that I've been intrigued with, that there's a reason why the average person leader is, is attached more to negative things than positive things, more to the problems than the solutions. And it's because of, you know, a lot of it's human nature in the aspect of, it's called, the, I don't know if you're familiar with the Velcro Teflon effect. Velcro, there's a reason why we, we do a good job at something and we're receiving 10 praises for the great job, but then we receive one negative thing negative. and we all of a sudden like, oh, throw out the 10 positives, man. I'm just obsessing about the one thing that went wrong. I guess I wasn't on point. I guess I'm not. And, and so it's almost like positive things can 
almost be like Teflon slide off and the negative things stick. And so what we can do is we can retrain the brain to think more positively, but it requires us to actually meditate on good things for a minimum of 20 seconds each and be as specific Mm -hmm. as we possibly, possibly can. Now we engage our senses in that place of gratitude and thankfulness and the brain starts firing off certain things that in time now, it starts to give way to more of a positive approach, perspective, and in time culture as well. Yeah. I mean, we've been kind of talking around it, but it sounds like this is the heart of your inside out leadership philosophy, isn't it? It sure is. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it is literally st- not trying about a bunch of outside techniques and strategies. There's a place for them but they're temporary. It's more or less starting in the heart, starting in the mind with things that matter most. And I found one of those things that help us awaken, help us live a higher perspective is living a life of intentional gratitude. Mm. Again, it doesn't mean that we stay up in the clouds. Right. We got to deal. But I feel that out of that thankful place, we can begin actually looking at the problem from a different perspective and now creativity flows now inspiration breathing life into that problem it's uh it's approached out of a completely different place yeah i i I remember hearing about i didn't see the study myself but they did some report they were measuring sort of the electromagnetic field that the body generates when we're in different emotional states and they found that when we're in appreciation and gratitude, it's like a higher level frequency yeah. than other emotional states. So that when we come from gratitude, it, it's literally affecting our physical body, not just our mental state. And so what you're saying is, is that when we come from that place, we're able to find the solutions and we're able to like find our way through in a much more effective and efficient way. That's right. And I also believe you're spot on. Um, We're more present out of that place, or there's a potential to be more present out of that place. You know, another, another Harvard health study shows this. I recently came across this. I'm a big, I love studies because um, I believe in my inside out leadership message, but I also believe in the practical facts and truths that back it up. And in this uh, Harvard Health study, it shows that so many people um, either see the glass half filled or half empty or whatever the case may be, right? You're either a pessimist or an optimist. And and I always like to say, Sam, this isn't going to surprise you and your listeners at this point, but I always like to say, well, the glass is always overflowing. I mean, that for me, that's where it's always at. But she brings up an interesting point in that she said, it's not pessimistic thinking it's not an optimistic thinking as much as it is present thinking Mm, yeah and when we live in and out of a place of gratitude thankfulness what we're grateful for who we're grateful for it invites us into this world of presence yeah because it could even be something you were grateful for that happened last week it could be something that's going to be you're going to be grateful for in the future but then now we're actually giving gratitude, having a time, intentional time of thankfulness in the moment for that thing that happened last week or what's going to happen next month. Right. And that's a special invitation for us to absorb, to embrace, and to live out of, lead out of this place called gratitude. So yeah, big part of my inside out leadership message is gratitude. No and, doubts about it. And I'm really, really glad to hear you talk about presence because it's also a big part of what I teach people and people ask me like how do you become a a great um you know radio show host and stuff and i say well it's all about really being present with your guest being present to the conversation but what takes us out of presence what takes us out of presence is fear it's thinking about the past or thinking about the future but in negative terms but when we're really here in the present moment in the present moment everything is great that's right and and one of my teachers he once said that you know, the person who is the most present in a room actually has the most power. Ooh. Because if you're in a meeting and there are, let's say, five people there and you're more present than any anyone else to the people in the room, you're able to 
feel their energy, read their body language, listen to their tone of voice more, and then you know where people are at, and then you're able to meet them there and move them in the direction you want to move, where somebody who's not present, who's not aware, they're not going to pick up on those subtle things, and so they don't really have the same influence that you do as someone who's being very present. But if if we're constantly stuck in being a firefighter, dealing with crises, dealing with everything that's wrong, we're not going to be present because we're going to be distracted, aren't we? Mm -hmm. That's right. You know, I'm also reminded of um, in uh, in Canada, uh, there was a, a city in Canada that a superintendent um, really started to have great influence on the law enforcement department of this particular geographical area. And he said, everyone's giving uh, negative tickets out, but let's start really honing in on giving positive tickets. And they had a tremendous, Sam, youth, I mean, uh, problem and challenges and, and just crime was through the roof. Uh-huh. Let me just tell you, the superintendent's influence on this law enforcement team throughout a span of about 10 years committed to the positive tickets. The culture started to shift. They started to become more present, more appreciative of the community members and even the youth and not obsessed with the wrong as much as they're obsessed with the right and started to fan that flame. The people, the community members, the youth started to feel more valued and appreciated. And let me just, it didn't happen overnight. Right, right. But throughout the course of about 10 years, crime went down about 60%, six zero. Tremendous impact on that particular community. So when we live and lead out of this place, all of a sudden now we can be more present with the one in front of us. And when we are, they can't help but feel valued, loved on, encouraged, inspired. Mm -hmm. And let's be real with our leaders listening. That's the place where a lot of magic comes from. That's the place where true connection, trust is built and fostered. The best ideas come in and out of that place as well. Now, trying to solve a problem based on the how, having those higher perspectives. Wow. Wow. Cool. I, I, I'm curious, do you feel leaders today are more open to this message than they've been in the past? Absolutely. hundred percent. I mean, they, I think my message, your message, I, we've been teaching it. We've been sharing it for years Yeah. and there's been certainly influence and great impact. We know that locally, you know, nationally and globally. But now I think there has been an awakening coming in and out of COVID and all that COVID has shared with us to where leaders are far more receptive. I think, uh, and this is leaders in every generation, whether it's the, even the Gen Zs, the millennials, the Gen, you know, and, and then the baby boomers, it doesn't matter who you are. I think the average person and leader now cares about the things, the people that matter most to them. They truly want to make a difference. that's going to be lasting. Yeah. Thus, they're able to receive a message of mindfulness, presence, inside out leadership in a way, arguably, than they never, ever have been before. So I think, and not just I think, Sam, I know that the leaders that embrace this and really take it back to their teams and want to see culture changed bit based on these messages I think productivity is going to go through the war, the roof. I think um, the impact and influence. I think the um, uh, the community transformation that organizations and leaders within those organizations are going to have. It's going to have a scratch in the, our heads in a good way, being like, "What is happening here?" A lot of great stuff. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And you just said something, and I just want to highlight it before we go to our last break which is that the when you you make this internal shift as the leader you shift the culture of your organization and and as a dear friend of mine used to say all the time culture will eat strategy every day of the week yeah. so you can have the best strategy but if you have the worst culture you're not going to do very well as an organization but you can have a so-so strategy but you can have a great culture and that will and that organization will far outshine another organization that doesn't have the same components put together. So it's Agreed. like we're, we're kind of on the same plane. All right. It's time, believe it or not, 
to take our last break, uh, come back for our last segment. It's, time always flies when I have such interesting, wonderful guests. When we come back, I want to ask you about the future. Like, where are we going and, and how do leaders today deal with what they have to deal with today to bring the future about that they want to bring about, okay? Sounds great. Awesome. So everyone, please stay tuned. You're listening to the Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity. We've been speaking this hour with author Rob Holman, and we'll be right back in just a moment. Hey, everybody, it's Tommy D, the nonprofit sector connector coming at you from my attic. Each week here on talkradio.nyc, I host a program, Philanthropy in Focus. Nonprofits impact us each and every day, and it's my focus to help them amplify their message and tell their story. Listen each week at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time until 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on talkradio.nyc. In a post-COVID world, you may have many unanswered questions regarding your health. Are you looking to live a healthier lifestyle? Do you have a desire to learn more about mental health and enhance your quality of life? Or do you just want to participate in self-understanding and awareness? I'm Frank R. Harrison, host of Frank About Health, and each Thursday, I will tackle these questions and work to enlighten you. Tune in every Thursday at 5 p.m. on talkradio.nyc, and I will be Frank About Health to advocate for all of us. Are you a conscious co-creator? Are you on a quest to raise your vibration and your consciousness? I'm Sam Leibowitz, your Conscious Consultant, and on my show, The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, we will touch upon all these topics and more. Listen live at our new time on Thursdays at 12 noon Eastern Time. That's The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, Thursdays, 12 noon on talkradio.nyc. You're listening to Talk Radio NYC at www.talkradio.nyc. Now broadcasting 24 hours a day. All right, Rob, this is a section of the show where we do a little prognostication. So if I'm a leader today and I'm dealing with a lot of these challenges, you know, what's happening in our environment, um, the way actually uh, I see a few people talking a lot now these days about how population is actually declining and how that's going to be a challenge for us. There's not going to be enough people to, to do the work that needs to get done. The, the division that we see around us. How do I today as a leader bring my my community or my organization forward and deal with all of these challenges and still be able to, to meet them and have an impact? So historically speaking, many different organizations and the leaders within them have taken care of their people through creating and sustaining professional development plans and strategies. Hmm. In other words, in other words, here's who you are. Here's where we want you to be. How can we best serve you in getting there? It's good. It's noble. It's admirable. No problems with that. We need to add an extra layer. And that's personal development meets professional development hmm. in the workplace. Hmm. So I have found the most effective organizations, regardless if they're non or for profit, are committed to work with each team member within the organization and helping them develop and maintain a personal development plan, mm -hmm. and then bridge that into the professional development plan, okay? Mm -hmm. You say, well, Rob, how do I do that? You know, people want some practicalities here, and that's what I'm all about. It's, it's taking a look at and spending the time with each team member, starting with yourself as a leader now, because we can only give what we got, right, Sam? We already uh -huh. talked about that. Yeah. So speaking to each leader, What's your mantra for the next 12 months? What's your mantra? What is it that you're truly after in your personal life? What is it? Is it working smarter, not harder? Is it living a life of gratitude? Is it quality of time? Is it what's your mantra? And then break it in bite-sized pieces based on outcomes. 
where do you see yourself by the end of this 12 months personally and think holistically, spiritually, emotionally, physically, mentally, career-wise? So, if, and, and state those outcomes in positive terms. They, they become declarations in a sense, okay? There's my gratitude. Again, it keeps on rearing its head here, Sam. Gratitude. Yeah. Based on your personal mantra, based on five positive outcomes of things you believe will come to pass with the help of other people, certainly, and the help of resources and tools for enlistment, but nonetheless will come to pass. And then each month, what's one practical step that I can take under each of those outcomes to create momentum each month? And each month builds off the next, you know, from the, the month of prior. So if we, if it starts with us as the leader and we're committed to a personal development space like that, personal development track like that, and then we help our team members with their personal development tracks or an HR leader or director to help them with their personal development track. Here's what it does. It makes each team member, starting with us first, feel valued, respected, appreciated, not based on what we do, based on who we are. Mm -hmm. Now we have a finger on the pulse and we can inspire that individual. We can encourage that individual. We can make sure to hold them accountable, not based on, you know, professional this, professional that, but based on who they are and their deepest desires personally. Hmm. And then start building the bridge into professional. Wow. You talk about increased productivity. That's why I always like to say that if you want to have increased productivity, you just might be surprised by a thankful heart. Yeah. I think if we're committed to a personal development track that feeds into the professional, it's certainly going to have leaders and their team members off and running for the upcoming year. No doubt about it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it brings up an important point because productivity is not always about how many hours a day they're putting into the job. It's not about working a 60 hour, 70 hour, 80 hour work week. But when we're, when we're in a supportive environment, when we're in an environment where we can feel grateful because we know we have the support of, of the whole culture of the organization, that then we're more free to be more creative, to figure out more creative solutions and actually be more productive in less hours. Yeah. The, spot on. The, the days of the carrot and stick method of leadership are over. Yeah. Uh, people are longing for their voice to be heard, for them to be seen, for them to be experienced. And it takes time as a leader. Right. It takes time to get to know your people in and through an exchange of story and through helping them develop their personal development track like I just shared. It takes right. time. Right. But as an end result, it demonstrates to your people that you are here to put people before procedures mm. for greater results. So what would you advise somebody who ends up in an organization that's not like this? Like, like that type of an organization is what they're looking for. And, and they end up taking a job and they're in some organization. And then over a period of time, it becomes obvious, like this is not what the organization is about. How would you counsel that person? Yeah. So, yeah, that alignment of values, for instance, just isn't there. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's like the natural response of anyone is I'm out. I think I'm just out. I need to bounce. I need to get out of here. I just need to be in alignment. I would be like, not so fast. Mm -hmm. Maybe in time that may be the case. But could it be not based on your title, not based on even your responsibilities, but just based on who you are and the awakening that you have in your heart and soul and mind that you could become the greatest change agent for that organization. Mm -hmm but they're waiting for you to become that. Right. So now I'm not saying it's for everyone. I'm not saying it's for 25 years of doing that, right. but it might just be exactly what the organization needs and the leadership needs, but they might not be fully aware of it. Aware of it yet. Exactly. So exactly. hold tight. And maybe there could be a bit of a process of intentionality on your part of seeing certain things through, demonstrating certain things, helping people and serve people in various ways, having influence. If you're a mid-level manager on the C-suite, for instance, on the people on the ground, because that's the beauty of mid-level managers too. Yeah. 
is they're in the, some of the C-suite meetings, but they're also boots on the ground and in some of those meetings as well. So there's a, a lot of encouragement that can go around, even if one feels like, I think I need to get out. I guess I'm just saying, not so fast, not so fast. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. It's kind of like if you find yourself in a situation, you're probably there for a reason. Right. You know, before you you exit so quickly, let's see if, if you can be the 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 change that you want to see in the world right that's right that's right i was at i was i was speaking somewhere not too long ago and a woman came up to me and we had a wonderful chat of about 45 minutes on the topic that i spoke on called re-engage from the inside out mm. and sam i started to speak with her and she's like i i don't know if i should leave i don't know if i should leave rob what should i do mm. and i said have you ever thought your thought of yourself based on the awakening that you have, your skill set, your gifts and experience that you could, you are not just could be, but you actually are a gift to this organization and they may not fully aware, be aware of it right now. Mm. She goes, I've never viewed myself like that. Yeah. I said, what would it look like for you to unwrap yourself, so to speak, so they can see the beauty, smell the fragrance, become more and more aware of what's attainable in and through you. So you've been awakened and perhaps you could be the one that helps awaken the rest, but there's only one way to tell, stick it out just a little longer to see. Mm. And she was greatly encouraged by that. So mm. I don't know. We'll see. Maybe I'll get a message in a, in a, in a few months, Rob, I stuck it out. The whole culture is changing now, but mm. even if it doesn't uh, in the long term work out for her, hopefully she takes that mindset, that heart with her, wherever she goes. Right, right. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, wonderful note to end the show on. Thank you, Rob. If, if people want to learn more about your work, if they want to find you, is there a website or someplace they can go? Yeah, tons of different websites, but I'll just highlight one, Sam. And yeah. that would be my personal website, Rob Holman. That's Rob with two Bs, Holman.com, Rob Holman.com. Wonderful, wonderful. And your books, Lead the Way, All In and Move the Needle, they're available at all the major but all the majors have their individual websites. Yeah, you can. You, people can always message me on a, any different social media outlet or channel, and I'd be happy to get back to them if they have any questions as well. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, you know, in preparation for Thanksgiving coming up, I think this is a quite an appropriate show to, to talk about gratitude and appreciation and how that is a, a leadership uh, way of being. So thank you, Rob. I appreciate your time. Thank you for coming on the show today. Sam, the gratitude's all mine. Thank you so much. You are a tremendous gift, uh, not only to me today, but to everyone that has experienced you. So thank you and keep doing what you're doing. People are being impacted. So appreciate you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Rob. Really appreciate that. And of course, thank you, my loyal listeners. Without you, there is no show. I so appreciate everyone, whether you're listening on the podcast platforms live or in studio. Thank you so much. I appreciate you all. Remember to stay tuned. You have uh, Frank Harrison in his show, Frank About Health, this evening at 5. Tomorrow we have our business shows, uh, Philanthropy and Focus, and always Friday. And we start back up again Monday evening with Sandra's show, uh, The Edge of Every Day at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Thank you so much. We will talk to you all next week. business owner? Do you want to be a business owner? Do you work with business owners? Hi, I'm Stephen Fry, your small and medium-sized business or SMB guy, and I'm the host of the new show, Always Friday. While I love to have fun on my show, we take those Friday feelings of freedom and clarity to discuss popular topics on the minds of SMBs today. Please join me and my various special guests on Friday at 11 a.m. on talkradio.nyc. Are you on edge? 
Hey, we live in challenging, edgy times, so let's lean in. I'm Sandra Bargeman, the host of The Edge of Every Day, which airs each Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time on talkradio.nyc. Tune in live with me and my friends and colleagues as we share stories and perspectives about pushing boundaries and exploring our rough edges. That's The Edge of Every Day on Mondays at 7 p.m. Eastern Time on talkradio.nyc. Are you a small business trying to navigate the COVID-19 related employment laws? Hello, I'm Eric Sauver, employment law business law attorney and host of the new radio show, Employment Law Today. On my show, we'll have guests to discuss the common employment law challenges business owners are facing during these trying times. Tune in on Tuesday evenings from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern time on talkradio.nyc. COVID world, you may have many unanswered questions regarding your health. Are you looking to live a healthier lifestyle? Do you have a desire to learn more about mental health and enhance your quality of life? Or do you just want to participate in self-understanding and awareness? I'm Frank R. Harrison, host of Frank About Health, and each Thursday, I will tackle these questions and work to enlighten you. Tune in every Thursday at 5 p.m. on talkradio.nyc, and I will be Frank About Health to advocate for all of us. Passionate about the conversation around racism? Hi, I'm Reverend Dr. TLC, host of the Dismantle Racism Show, which airs every Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern on talkradio.nyc. Join me and my amazing guests as we discuss ways to uncover, dismantle, and eradicate racism. That's Thursdays at 11 o'clock a.m. on talkradio.nyc. You're listening to Talk Radio NYC. Uplift, educate, empower. 